So I just want to say, first of all, congratulations. You are a founder. I'm a three-time founder myself. I just started my third startup and Mucker is a investor into that one. Um, I know the journey. I know the fact that you guys are probably foregoing better salary positions um, and leaving very stable, comfortable lives behind in order for you to go down this road less traveled. So first of all, congratulate yourselves for taking that step because not many people do. The second thing that I go to is, uh, it's called like the scrappy mindset, right? I mean, it's the topic of the hour. It's the idea of scrappiness. And there's a few people that I tend to gravitate to. I know everybody's a little bit different. Um, I think of like people like David Goggins and The Rock and the idea of his production company being called Seven Bucks Productions. And, you know, I've heard interviews from his, uh, you know, people that are friends of his where he constantly feels that, you know, he could go back to having $7 in his pockets next week. And I think that's really at the heart of it, what Scrappy means to me. Um, myself, you know, just speaking from my perspective, um, as a founder, you know, not too long ago, uh, when I first started my first startup about almost a decade ago, I was answering phones at a cancer care clinic for 12 bucks an hour, just trying to make way so I can get my startup off the ground. And, um, and I think that's when most of the, your, your craziest, most creative problem solving skills really kick in is in these moments when you're kind of like backed up against the wall. Um, and I'm sure each of you guys probably as founders have your own stories in that regard. And a lot of the things that I'm gonna share with you now going forward is gonna come from those types of places, right? So really hacky things, um, some scalable, uh, some not so scalable, but will help you get to uh, the best kind of like optimization between messaging and channels in order for you to start generating growth. And I look at growth in different stages, right? So year one is gonna look very different than year five. Um, and what are the steps to get there? And I work, you know, just for your back, for my background uh, and for more context, you know, I've been working with Mucker, um, like John said, on uh, Mucker Lab companies. So these are like kind of pre-revenue type of companies on their grow to market motions, really instilling uh, founder-led sales teams to understand how to build a sales process before they do their first sales and marketing hires. It's really important because the founder needs to have this skill set because they're going to be setting the baseline for whoever they hire against it. So I think that's one of the things I really wanted to kind of convey here. Also, uh, I focus primarily on outbound channels. Um, and the reason for that is because inbound can get very expensive very fast. If any of you guys as founders have gone out and tried to do paid channels, you can understand and probably I'm sure you guys have gone through that plight, um, especially when you're experimenting. Outbound also allows you to iterate fairly quickly. Um, and you can learn a lot from just that experimentation process, which then you can go back to paid channels and then have a much better ROI than just starting off there. Uh, you have also more predictability control over your sales pipeline with outbound. Typically, you also see higher ACVs with outbound versus inbound, and that's because just quality and having more of a sniper approach allows you to get uh, a lot more granular with the type of prospects you're going after. Um, it's not to say you don't want to ever do paid channels or do inbound, right? It's just that once you have more brand equity, a shift to inbound starts making more sense. All right, there's uh, some terms that we get thrown around all the time. I'm sure you guys have heard these, of these terms. Um, I try to dumb it down to really simplistic terminology. So some of those terms might be like ICP or ideal customer profile and personas. This breaks down to who do you want to talk to? Channels, where can you talk to them? Sequence of messaging is how do you turn a response into a meeting? KPIs, it's measure, rinse, and repeat, and then beat whatever it is that baseline metric is in terms of conversion. Um, if you are, again, this is primarily for B2B SaaS founders, uh, but your go-to is probably going to be a go-to call to action is going to probably be a product demo of some sort. And so your main goal is to generate SQLs, right? And that's the definition is like, how do you get to book meetings? This is the roadmap of things here. So again, breaking it down, who do I talk to? Where can I talk to them? What do I say? How do I get a response? And then how do I get more responses? Um, I'll come back to this towards the end, but, and you guys can, I'll get this presentation emailed to you too, so don't feel like you have to keep snapping away. Um, but you start here, which is like defining who your ICP and persona is. 
you can't imagine how many founders I talk to that like don't know what it is. And it's not to say that it has to be definitive and set in stone that it's just one ICP and persona. You could have 10, but you need to define what they are and then start going after the lowest hanging fruit. Know what those three to five are to start testing with um, and seeing what conversion looks like for that group and then moving to different types of ICPs and personas. Um, you know, I think like variables like sales cycle and then LTV is what comes into my mind when you are evaluating ICP and personas because they're going to convert differently. And based on what your operational objective is, you know, if you're going out raising a round, you might want to go after the whales and the bigger logos that have longer sales cycles, super high ICVs, but you're going to have to know that that's going to be a longer, t longer tail game. Um, versus if you're looking to just get to break even a profitability, you're going to focus on shorter sales cycles, lower ACVs, things you can get wins in fairly quickly. So then it goes to where can I talk to them? Where are they? List building, building your database, identifying the channels. Channels can be, this is the fun part, is because you can get really, really creative. Um, creating cohorts for testing, creating those sequences, creating your messaging, scheduling it out, launching it, tracking, getting the responses. To me, it's always getting to a binary response as quickly as possible. You want to get to a yes or no. You can't be afraid of getting to the no's. But I think when you get to the no's, what a lot of people don't do is do the objection categorization. So you want to understand why people say no, because you can actually solve for that. right? If you know that you're losing out constantly to a specific competitor, you can highlight certain features or functions that you do better than that competitor. Um, if you're missing a feature or function, you can prioritize your product roadmap to then accommodate for that so you can go out and have a better chance of getting a win. All right, so we're going to start off with who do you want to talk to? This might be you know, very rudimentary to some, but again, I think it's a super important point to hammer home on. And it's the idea of ICP or ideal customer profile. And usually this is going to be based on a company level. So I think you need to know whether you're going after SMBs, mid-market, enterprise. Sometimes it could be a mix of all of them. Uh, but again, you want to prioritize what you're going to go after first. Um, at any given time, you want to know what that looks like. SMB, you know, is like to me, we define it as like a local brick and mortar business. Mid market is a professional service based business with multiple locations. There's a few examples down there. Enterprise is like your large multinational corporations. Then, to get even more granular than that, we want to understand vertical revenue, headcount. Um, because a company that is automotive doing under a million with less than 10 people, you're going to sell to very differently than somebody that's in the automotive industry doing 50 to 100 million with 500 to 1,000 headcount. The problem and the pain points are going to be very, very different. So how you position your solution is going to be very, very different. Personas by individual. So this comes down to like things like seniority, department that they're in, the type of decision maker or influencer that they are. Um, I always like to figure out what does the persona look like, right? Because we're not necessarily all these special, unique snowflakes. Like VP of marketing people are going to tend to look like VP of marketing people. Um, engineers are going to tend to look like engineers and, and vice versa. So um, it's also going to boil down to kind of just psychology. Like the types of people that enter these types of roles are going to think very similarly. And that's going to be important, especially when we get down to things like messaging. And this is, again, just an example of ICP and persona uh, being put together. And you want to get to something like this, ultimately, so that, and again, it could be a list of 10, 15, 20, but you want to start being able to have this level of granularity and understanding of what ICP and persona mix you're going after. Now, who do you want to talk to today? And this is. Um, I think super important because not a lot of companies do this also, which a Tam Sam Som analysis. Uh, how many of you guys heard of Tam Sam Som just by show of hands? Okay, awesome. Um, so I think this is important because Tam is great for when you're going to do an investor pitch, but Som is really important for your go to market, right? And that's the idea of like, look, we're building a product that 10 years from now is going to be able to service the Tam. But what our product is today. What does that actually look like? What's that percentage of the TAM we can actually service today? And you want to know what that looks like because when you start narrowing down your ICP and personas, what, looks, what your SOM is going to look like is going to look very different from the TAM. 
And also, let's just look at your Tam Sam song from a volume perspective, right? So, if I'm targeting founders of startups for as you know my my ICP persona mix, that might equate to 142,000 in the U.S., right? Those are the types of individuals I could be going after, but not everybody is going to be fitting into what I can service today. So I'm going to want to look at my SOM because that's what I'm going to start building out my go-to-market motions with if I'm starting off in my year one, year two. Channels, uh, this boils down to where can you talk to them. And I'm going to do just a quick show of hands here. Uh, with your go-to-market motions and what you guys are doing right now, how many of you guys are using email as a channel? Sure. How many of you guys are doing LinkedIn DMs as a channel? Sure, okay. How many of you guys do cold calls as a channel? Ringless voicemail? Not so many, okay. So by show of hands, right? Cold calls, dr direct message through LinkedIn, emails. Most of you guys raised your hand. So you guys are all competing for the same attention to a certain degree with a lot of other marketers that might be providing a similar solution or targeting the same ICP and persona types. So you, have all, you guys have all probably been on the receiving end of this, right? Which is your inboxes. LinkedIn is now just spam heavy, right? Um, and it's really hard to compete for that attention. Uh, things like ringless voicemail, it's scalable. People don't necessarily look at it a lot of times. Um, SMS, you can get data from Crunchbase uh, with phone numbers, and a lot of times founders forget when they sign up for Crunch. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So we'll get there in a second about like how how all of this works, how you execute on them, what tools to use. Don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, this is just a breakdown of the different data points and then the channels that you can realize from that data point, right? A phone number can be used for SMS, ring lists, cold calls, emails can be used for email. You can also use emails to retarget through paid channels, mailing addresses for direct mail, social media URLs, not just isolated to LinkedIn, but if you're targeting SMB or mid-market, Facebook URLs, Twitter handles, etc. Next thing we're talking about is building a database. This is going to be your biggest asset, right? So when you're targeting a specific ICP and persona, you know, plus or minus in any given year might be a few thousand change. But like if I'm targeting pediatricians, for example, that might be 60,000 in the United States, right? And that's only going to fluctuate plus or minus, you know, a thousand or so every year. Um, but I want to get to building that database of all 60,000. And ultimately, I want to get to a binary answer as quickly as possible to all 60,000. Right, that's the goal. So big, building your database is going to be your biggest asset. And I'm going to give you a bunch of like tools here as to how to build your database. I mean, this is probably a pretty easy go-to example for most people using paid databases, right? Zoom Info, Seamless, Clearbit, using LinkedIn scraping tools, that kind of stuff. Um, I share with you kind of like here ICP that this is great for data that you can typically get, channels that you can use from that data. And this is like a pulled kind of result just from, uh, from Zoom Info as an example. Not a lot of phone numbers though, so you don't have access to the SMS, ringless voicemail, you know, cold call um, for direct, for direct uh, contact. But you do have email addresses and you do have LinkedIn contacts, but again, by show of hands, we already know those are really like noisy channels. So these are some of the more interesting stuff, like directories. Not a lot of people think about this. Um, if you know that phone numbers can yield to SMS, like these three additional channels, right? Directories like Yellow Pages, Yelp, even Google Maps. You're getting a physical mailing address and a phone number. And when you're talking about, especially like on the SB, SMB side, um, and you're talking like general contractors or uh, hairstylists, cosmetologists, those phone numbers are going to usually be mobile numbers. And so that's going to give you direct access to, to them. Another thing a lot of people don't think about is public databases. Um, most licensed professionals will be listed in a public database. And if you just Google the license name, cosmetologist, for example, plus the geography, Los Angeles, with license lookup, it'll show you 
different databases that they're lo located in. Um, this one is actually focused on short-term rental owners or vacation property owners. And you can see here that I'm able to get the management company, an email address, a phone number, the name. Um, that's a lot of information, right? Uh, it gives you a lot of access points. And again, just focus on channels, right? I think you got to think of it in this context. It's like, great, now I can get in front of them. Later, we're going to discuss about what, what the hell you should say. Conventions, I think, is a pretty common one. Um, but you don't have to necessarily be a sponsor to get the lists. You can go on to, a lot of them have like databases on their sites. This is from the Magic Convention, which again, if you're targeting like fashion e-commerce brands, um, you can actually get this level of information. I just did this yesterday, where you can get a domain, you get a social media handle um, for both Instagram and Facebook, and you can scrape all this information. And you can then utilize it for Instagram DM, Facebook DM, uh, you can find an email from that domain through a web crawler or a scraper. All of a sudden, that gives you like three to four access points. Professional groups is another one. Uh, this is going to be good because you can actually scrape members of a, of, a, of a public group or professional group. So Facebook groups, this is from restaurant owners that I looked up, 18,000 members there. Um, LinkedIn groups also. And you can then automate DMs to them through all these, some of these tools that I'll show you in a second. Job boards. If your solution is actually just placing a role, this is a great opportunity for you to then like look up people who are hiring against that role that you're actually displacing and find a point of contact. And then that allows you an opportunity to present or you know, position yourself to a, a prospect that you know is actively searching for a solution. And if your solution is like 30% the cost of a physical human hire, I mean, you can, prov you can provide a pretty compelling narrative. Uh, this is another one that's more hacky, but like creating job posts to build a list. Um, if you're looking for general contractors, why not create a job post on Craigslist looking for general contractors. You can be as detailed as you want about the general contractor. Um, and then you can literally get a bunch of people to apply to you, have a whole list of like general contractors to then go remarket to them later. Um, and it's the same thing, like look, you know, if you're looking for a VP of sales, most of the times people who are looking for jobs already have jobs. So you're trying to target VP of sales, post for a VP of sales, make it a really amazing job post, collect a bunch of people um, information, and then you can retarget them, remarket to them later. Forums is another great place. Um, this isn't necessarily a great place to do for list building and getting direct contacts in, the, in a direct way, but I'm going to show you how to use surveys in the form of like market research as a lead magnet, uh, where you're actually going to get people to self-qualify themselves as prospects for, for you. Um, but it is a good way also, I'm sure a lot of companies have done this, where you're using it for backlinking, you're using it for astroturfing. The idea of astroturfing is building trust within these communities, and you're able to generate prospects from being in these forums. This is another good one, I think, that a lot of people don't think about. But looking at your competitors' social profiles. Um, <laughs> this idea came to me, but it's like I had a really bad experience with Postmates. And I wanted to, somebody literally just used my account, um, one of the Postmate drivers, to buy a bottle of Patron for themselves. And uh, I was really pissed off. And so I was trying to find support for Postmates and it ultimately was driving me to their Postmates support page. Postmates support page has a bunch of users here that ultimately are pissed off at Postmates. So if I'm Uber Eats or I'm competing against Postmates, why don't, why don't I scrape all of the people that are on their support page and then remarket to them my service? Um, same deal is like you can look at a build.com if you're another like competitor to build.com or another payment solution. The followers of build.com are probably customers of build.com, right? So it's another opportunity for you to then like list build against um, your target ICP and personas, and then the, again it comes down to messaging. But what are you going to say that's going to show that you're actually better than build.com? 
So this is probably the thing that you do want to take a picture of real quick, even though you will get it, because this summarizes everything I just talked about. Um, this is the different sources, ICPs that it's good for in terms of SMB, mid-market enterprise. The different examples, list building tools, um, the data that you can capture and the channels that you can leverage from that data. And by no means, like, are these the only channels? Are these the only sources? I mean, you guys can get super, super creative, right? Like, I mean, I'm using this t-shirt as a way to be a channel because on the back of it, there's a QR code and literally <laughs> there's a call to action on the back of the shirt. And this is some of the tools that we're, I've just uh, listed on there, but um, again, you'll get access to all this stuff. Things like Phantom Buster, Snove.io, Clearbit, not a lot of people necessarily are familiar with them. You might be familiar with some of these other ones, um, but those are more like the hackier types of tools. So now we talk about creating cohorts. Uh, let's just say you built your database of 10,000. You're not gonna go, you know, hit up all 10,000 on day one, right? Um, especially if you have no idea what kind of messaging is gonna convert them. So what I typically will do is, let's just say there's 50,000 startup founders um, in my serviceable attainable market. I divide it by, like the time is completely arbitrary, but I divide it by 10 weeks. And the reason why I say 10 weeks is because that gives me a weekly volume of 5,000 outreaches per week. And then week 11 comes around, I'm gonna go back to that original cohort that I start off with today with new messaging, uh, you know, different types of language. And over that time period, you should have more logos, new social proof, new features about your product that you can actually highlight. Um, you're just gonna remove all those that responded, you know, during that time from your initial sequence. Um, and then just continue again, work your way through to get to that binary response. During this time though, if from that 10 week period, you do wanna make sure that entire database is continuing to get some kind of brand awareness around what you guys do. And that can be in the form of a newsletter that's going out one to two times a month or through paid ads, where you're creating a custom audience targeting that, targeting that entire database again. Yeah. Yeah. The whole idea is you wanna build trust, right? Like I could ultimately be a mad scientist and have a cure for cancer in my refrigerator, but if I don't have 20 years of like medical research under my belt and a renowned medical professional in the cancer community, my biggest hurdle isn't the fact that I don't have a great product. My biggest hurdle is getting people to trust me to take it, right? Yeah. How do you, when you email sequence, uh, how do you like spam? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send that to you guys in a tutorial. Like there are like best practices around how to avoid that, um, but again, there's warm up tools for inboxes. There's things that you can do on your DNS server in order for you to like make sure that, um, yeah, different records that you can add into it to make sure that you can avoid it as best as possible. But ultimately you want to build up and scale up volume. All right. So we talked about creating a sequence here. Um, all right. Consumer journey, right? Like if I was selling you a brand new, no name brand of sneak like running shoes, you probably wouldn't respond if I just completely just bombarded you with email all day long into buying this pair of sneakers from a no-name brand. Typically the journey is gonna be like, hey, I see a billboard, I see an Instagram feed, I see a Hulu streaming ad, and then maybe like, you know, within two week time frame, if that company did a really good job of retargeting and knew that I was a runner and I got a discount code, you know, after two weeks, I'm gonna have a little bit more familiarity and a much higher chance of converting to a customer than if you just completely bombarded me with emails. For whatever reason in the B2B space, I see this all the time, which is I see a cohort going through just a cold call sequence, another cohort going through LinkedIn ads and, and requests and, and then uh, DMs, and another cohort just going through an email drip campaign. I think everybody's so like obsessed about automation when they don't necessarily know what works yet. And that becomes like this issue that we're facing now, which is a ton of marketing exhaustion from your, your prospects. Um, and we've all been on that end of things. Best thing to do would be take that single cohort, build out that sequence, leveraging these different channels, get in front of them in a lot of different ways. 
And this is what that might look like. So again, running paid ads to your custom audiences from your entire database, but for cohort one, that's gonna start you know, today, for example, let's just say you have a seven touch sequence. You have day one, LinkedIn ad request. You start with that because you need to give them a lead time in order for them to accept the request um, so that you can actually do the message. Uh, day two, you might do email one. Day four, ringless voicemail, five, so on and so forth. And then how I like to categorize the messaging that goes out over this type of like aggressive sales sequence that happens over the course of one to two weeks, and then you give them a break for like eight weeks before you go back with another aggressive sales sequence, um, is to do education heavy for the first third of the sequence. Education meaning don't worry about converting there. Just worry about sharing what you're building and why. The second group is, uh, of, of messaging is focused on the call to action. And a lot of times I just tried to minimize the call to action of one to two sentences. So following up on the below, um, you know, just wanted to see if you have five to 10 minutes. And it's as simple as that and you reference the context from the original outreach uh, for a point of reference. And again, just think through the psychology of what you guys do, right? Like, I'm sure you've been on that end where it's like, oh, now it's somewhat more important than when I just got it from the first time. The last group of messaging I like to focus on is called objection tracking. And this is where you're empathetic to that person's time and saying, hey, I'm gonna remove you from all the future outreaches, but I would love to know the reason why you're not interested right now. And for us, we make it super simple. Um, we actually will provide five multiple choice responses, A, B, C, D, or E, and ask them just to respond with one of them. And a lot of the times, 50% of them will usually come back and say, I am interested, I am super busy, but follow back with me in three months. And you actually get a response, and that's the goal that you're really trying to get to. Now we kind of get to the messaging part. We now know how to build our database, how to get contact information. And we know how to identify those channels. We've built out sequences, we've built out the cohorts. Now, what are you gonna to say to get to a meeting? Because this is super, super important. Um, I think the first thing to realize is all decisions are based on emotion. Um, a, lot of, a lot of times when I work with founders, like we see just, it's very binary in the language. Uh, it's focused on numbers and not necessarily about the human interaction. And I think that's really important to note because you know, even though you're in the B2B space, if you're providing some kind of SaaS solution, your narrative will typically be on like you're, you're improving the top line you know, revenue or you're improving margins somehow by increasing efficiency. But at the end of the day, what that boils down to is still some kind of human element, right? So if you're improving top line revenue, great, the company's earning more money, employees are earning more money, and that allows them to then share and build more wealth with the people that they love. At the end of the day, if you're improving margins, you know, either you're saving time or saving money, that again boils down to human interaction where people can then spend more time with their loved ones or um, make a conscious decision to actually grow the business as opposed to uh, feeling like they're just constantly putting out fires. And um, this might seem kind of corny, but I, we create messaging based on these emotions. And there are six basic human emotions, it's love, fear, anger, sadness, surprise, and joy. And I'm gonna share kind of like how we translate this into messaging. This is from a movie called Collateral Beauty. It's just something that I've taken away that I really have loved as a marketer, but um, it breaks down, I think, the, the human connection, which is we long for love, we wish we had more time, we fear death. And there's ways to translate this even into software. Emotional triggers. So catfish for attention, but not for product. Um, churn, everybody knows, is like the devil in the room. You never want to like have churn. So don't ever catfish your product, you know? Uh, but you can catfish for attention. And what I mean by that is, how do you use emotional triggers to get somebody's attention? How do you elicit a response? Um, the, again, boiling down to the six basic emotions here, love, the triggers are lust, attraction, attachment. So what can you do there? Well, you can adjust the image and the signature, adjust the gender, ethnicity, name, use emojis, flirty undertones. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm focused on outcome. And as much as it sucks, sometimes I've changed my last name from Shane to Shane, S-H-A-N-E, and we've tested this, and I tested this like four or five years ago, and I got a three times higher response rate. 
And that's just the world that we live in. But I'm, I'm a marketer and I focus on outcome. So it really depends on what you want to do there, but I think like this is how you can leverage these different emotional triggers as a way to improve performance and outcome. Fear, you know, threat of harm, real or imagined. So your prospect losing their job, underperforming. How is your solution helping to alleviate that fear? Or how is your solution then striking fear like into them that this is something that they need to strongly consider because it's going to prevent that from happening? I'm not going to go into all of them in detail, but I think you guys kind of get the idea. The other thing here is like leveraging social proof. Um, leverage any and all social proof that's going to build trust with your audience and be creative. Social proof can come in the form of logos, venture capital firms that's backed you, founder pedigree, having domain expertise, being a part of different associations, having different types of certifications, different types of accolades, having grants and awards. This is a good one because I don't think a lot of companies do this, which is you may not have any of these, but there are industry reports from third, third parties that people trust, reports from McKinsey, Bain, Deloitte, that kind of stuff, where you can then utilize to generate a proof for why uh, people need to start, be, start thinking about the pain point that you're actually solving for. ROI is very common. This is like the case studies, the testimonials, press, and then content. Content I think is super critical, but creating best practice guides, um, how to, providing insights, um, ideally from your product. This is another one where you guys might want to take a picture of it, but I actually share with you like an example of all the messaging um, over that course of that seven touch sequence as an example. You can template it however you see fit, but um, you'll get this also through email. All right. Now we're going to talk about actually scheduling and getting these things out there, because now we have the messaging done. We have the audience broken down. We know the channels we're using. This is the toolkit for uh, outreach automation. So the different channels, and this is by no means the only outreach automation tools. There's tons of them out there. Uh, but this is what we use as a way to iterate quickly. Um, if you're using SMS or ring list, you know, you might want to integrate with Twilio and use Twilio for that purpose. But um, if you don't know if SMS and ring list is going to be a viable channel yet, you don't want to go through the heavy lift of doing that. So why not just use some of these one-off resources? Um, this is stuff that we've used uh, as, a, as a growth marketing agency. Um, but you can, again, there's no one size fits all for all this. This is a sample schedule. So you set the dates, you set it up. Is it live yet? You have the list that you're pulling from, from the cohort that you created. Uh, you know the ICP that you're targeting. You have the subject lines, the language created. And this is the sender. Who's sending it out, like on whose behalf? What time is it going out? the platform that you're using to actually schedule it out. And then obviously you want to start measuring to what's been delivered. What's the percentage delivered? Delivered only gets you to like, all right, we know that they have a possibility of having seen it. it doesn't mean that they've seen it. And that's why tracking is really, really important. Um, if we go again back to the different uh, touches of the sequence, we want to know how many s opened it. Open means to me like they've had a chance to see it or it has the opportunity of them seeing it. What does that open rate look like? Um, open rates are purely reflective of subject lines, right? So if you have very, very low opens, you need to work on your subject line. Um, we tend to defer to a very, very simple subject line as being consistently high open rates, which is just high first name. Um, and then you want to really look at response rates. You cannot have a conversation unless you get a response. And I'm sure you guys have all experienced this too, where there's a marketer or SDR that's just having a one-sided conversation with themselves because you've been ignoring them for like three weeks, whether they're leaving voicemails or they're sending you emails or whatever, right? So at the end of the day, you're trying to get to that response. Um, and once you get a response, it's only then that you have the opportunity to, to understand if they're actually sincerely interested and whatever solution you're offering. And then from having that interest, how do you convert them into 
an actual meeting where you can talk to them about your product. And again, we talked about objections too, but that's super important to understand because you can solve for a lot of those objections. And then ultimately, after that whole sequence is completed over like a one to two week period, you can see what the breakdown is for your total cohorts. This is the stuff that your, your investors or your board is gonna really love and is gonna want you to have an understanding of what this looks like. Because this is gonna measure and help you figure out what needs to be tweaked in that sequence. Um, a few just like tips from when somebody expresses interest to actually getting them booked. We know statistically that uh, if somebody expresses interest, um, you have about a two hour window to get them booked. Otherwise, that percentage of getting them booked goes from 80% to 30%. Uh, within that two hour period, we have given our SDRs usually the green light to do seven to eight touches across three to four different channels to get them booked. And we've had very, very little pushback um, because they've already expressed interest. When you're doing seven to eight touches to somebody that has not said, yeah, I'm interested, yeah, they're gonna get pissed off. Um, we also don't like to send out self-scheduling links because it actually decreases the chance of people booking. I'm sure you guys have seen this too um, on the receiving end. We ask for three possible dates and times and statistically that gives us the opportunity for one of them to, to, to at least work with a client that we're working with. And again, if we go back to that full database and we're just looking at SOM, after one year and you running through all these exercises, this might be what some of your statistics look like. Um, you definitely want to get to this level of visibility and transparency around your pipeline. Because then you know what your true sum is. It's not truly like the whole 10,000, right? But it's more like 40% of that is actually obtainable, where there's actually some semblance of market fit. And again, um, talking about objection tracking, this is usually like the five categories that we'll use in that multiple choice or some variation of that in the language, but missing a feature or function, wrong person, circle back later, competitor, uh, using a competitor or not a fit. And this is just completely arbitrary numbers, but you can statistically, you'll always get to one or two that float to the top. And those are things that you, again, you can solve for or uh, empower your sales teams to understand and have that visibility because then they can go into a meeting knowing that if somebody's not moving forward, how to maneuver through that conversation. And just summarizing here, this now makes a lot more sense, I think, hopefully, <laughs> from what we just ran through. And that was like a pretty quick crash course, I think, from a go-to-market motion perspective. But again, I'll send you guys the entire presentation um, and then we have tutorials of actually how to utilize all those tools I mentioned. Um, so you guys can access to that. 